morning and welcome to our very first City of Pinellas Park, Our Town Talks talk show. I'm Jillian Rose, Fire and Life Safety Educator with the Pinellas Park Fire Department. And today our topic is preventing falls in our community. Falls are a major threat to health and independence of older adults in our community. Each year, one in three older adults aged 65 or older experiences a fall. And many people believe that falls are a normal part of aging. The truth is they're not. Many falls can be prevented. The purpose of the talk show today is to educate you on how you have the power to reduce fall risk and also protect your older loved ones from a serious fall. Fall prevention is a team effort and education is the key to fall prevention. So today we've put together an amazing panel of experts to join us in empowering our viewers on how to stay falls free. And now I introduce to you our Town Talk special host, your Pinellas Park Fire Chief, Chief Brett Schlatteler. Good morning, Chief. Thanks, Jillian. Um, I really appreciate you putting this all together. Um, so, uh, you know, we selected fall prevention for our first Town Talks topic. Uh, it's been something we've been working on now for the past couple of years at the Pinellas Park Fire Department. Uh, it's really a, uh, a subject uh, that we see every day. Um, about 11% of the calls in Pinellas Park of EMS calls are falls. Uh, most of them are related to seniors. Uh, that is about 1,800 calls we had in 2019 just for falls. Uh, and that statistic is growing. In 2015, we were at 1,575. So uh, it's really a, uh, it's a call type that we want to go down, not up. Uh, and that's why we started uh, working on this project last year. Um, some of the statistics uh, around falls, uh, about one in four Floridians over the age of 65 fall each year. Um, falls are the leading cause of inj uh, fatal injury uh, and the most common cause of non-fatal trauma-related hospital admissions uh, among our seniors. Uh, about one out of every 10 falls causes a serious injury, uh, like broken bones, head injury. Uh, and one of the reasons, another reason we picked falls is really when you look down at all the types of calls that we run on in EMS, uh, falls is one of the most preventable types of calls. Um, you know, some of the causes, uh, lower body weakness, uh, difficulty with walking and balance, loss of strength, um, medications uh, causing dizziness or uh, uh, fatigue, uh, things like that. Uh, vision problems, poor footwear, uh, and home hazards, uh, you know, uh, rugs that are loose, uneven steps, uh, no grab bars in the bathroom. Those types of things are all things that with some education and a little bit of practice uh, can really help us prevent uh, falls. So uh, it's just one of the things that we can really affect through some education and prevention. We have a great group of panelists. Uh, I'm just going to call on each panelist and ask them to introduce themselves, uh, explain uh, who they are, uh, what they do, and uh, why fall prevention is important to them. So our first uh, panelist is Dr. Andrea Alpel. Good morning. Thanks for having me a part of this. So uh, I work at Bayfront Health um, in St. Petersburg and in Pinellas Park, and I've been happy to be involved with fall prevention here with uh, the Pinellas Park Fire Department. Why fall prevention is important, I think, is just based on the statistics that the chief just gave. Um, we see those in the emergency department. We see the pain. We see the lack of independence. We see how it affects not only the patient, but the patient's family. So anything that we can do as a community, as a medical community, to, to help and prevent this very preventable thing is very important to us. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Ms. Arlene Grasso. Arlene? Hi, I'm Arlene Grasso. I'm president and co-owner of Access and Design. My daughter, Denise Tomey, and I started this business five years ago. I'm a certified building contractor that specializes in adaptive remodeling and um, construction from grab bars really to room additions. We originally started this because um, we wanted to help people stay safely uh, and age in place in their homes, utilize uh, universal design and um, uh, for their forever homes and really um, help people of disabilities of all ages to be more independent uh, as possible. But 
actually most of our business comes from people who have fallen. We get the frantic calls from the spouses, the children and caregivers of people who, have, who need to get out of rehab because they've fallen. Uh, most falls can be prevented. I also chair the Pinellas um, uh, Falls Prevention uh, Coalition under the Pinellas Community Foundation. And that's made up of very caring professionals and concerned professionals that work um, uh, very hard to prevent falls through education, awareness, and resources. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Uh, Jillian Rose. I'm Jillian Rose, Fire and Life Safety Educator for the Pinellas Park Fire Department, and keeping our community safe is truly a passion for me. Last year, I lost my mom due to complications that stem from a fall, and each and every time I hear the alarm tones go off at our station, I can't help but think, and it drives me, what more can we do to prevent falls through education? Fall prevention is truly important for me because I want to keep our community safe and help our older adults stay educated, active, and independent. <clears throat> Thanks, Jill. Uh, Arthur uh, Wernick. Thank you very much for making me a part of this terrific group of people. As a clinical pharmacist, my area of expertise is medication therapy management. I do a complete review of a patient's medication use. And I do it in coordination with the clinical conditions and their lifestyle. So it's unfortunate, but true, that some medications can increase the risk of falls. Medications that fall into the categories of medications for pain, medications for anxiety, and medications for blood pressure are three main areas where a patient can be at increased risk of falls. My goal is to try to reduce the risk for a patient and try to increase the chances that they will not have a fall. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Andrew Walker. Yes, uh, Andrew Walker with the uh, National Senior Games Association, uh, Director of Health and Wellness for the organization that hosts the National Senior Games every two years. It's a organization that um, uh, provides uh, health and wellness support to um, 60,000 athletes, senior athletes uh, throughout the uh, United States. Our research on senior game athletes has shown us that if you're active and engaged in sports, uh, physical activity, um, our athletes only show a 10% um, level of fall within a year. So they only report 10%, which is much lower than the general population. So that's one of the reasons why we um, uh, come to the table on falls prevention is to share the things that our athletes are doing that help uh, create this low number of falls and to bring a positive light to the discussion. Um, and then the reason why fall prevention is important to me is um, I was involved in public health uh, when I started an injury prevention program in Hillsborough County. And um, in addition, um, my father is 96 and he has some mobility problems and I'm concerned about his walking. So it has both a, uh, it's been a, a, a issue I've worked on for years. So, um, so it's both at home and as a part of my, my work um, experience. All right, thank you very much. Um, so on the phone, we have uh, Jackie Osborne. Hello, hello, I'm Jackie Osborne. Thank you very much for including me in this in this very special panel and project. I am a physical therapist. I, I am um, a physical therapist at Brooks Rehabilitation in Jacksonville, Florida. But I'm also a very active member in the Florida Physical Therapy Association and in our national association, the American Physical Therapy Association. So, so, so falls, um, I, I have a passion for fall prevention. And I think that's because I've, I've had an amazing opportunity in my career to work with people across all settings, not only in the community as active members of the community and athletes, but also after a devastating, maybe life-changing event, such as a fall with, with injury. And I, can, I know the value, I think, of, of physical activity and exercise, and I can see what it can do for the human body, regardless of someone's age. Uh, exercise is medicine, 
and I and I know the benefits of it. So, so I want to do what I can to to help prevent the fall before the injury happens. Um, so that's really my main mission is to help educate um, everyone that falls are not an inevitable part of aging. And um, sometimes there are little things that occur, like little trips or stumbles or changes of getting out of the chair is more difficult than it used to be. Those are signs. Those are signs to say, hmm, I think it might be time to look a little bit further into physical fitness or, you know, the things that um, that are happening in your body systems that a physical therapist could help you address um, to prevent falls. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, next, we have Mr. Keith Sabeel, Jr. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Brett. Uh, my name is Keith Sabeel. I am the Leisure Services Administrator for the City of Pinellas Park. Um, what that is, I oversee parks, rec, and library services uh, with the help of many other individuals. And uh, one of the main reasons that I am uh, very happy to be a part of this roundtable discussion is because you know, so many of our folks at the senior center um, need this type of education. We see them as a, not just members of our facility, but, uh, you know, extension of our, our family. So anything we can do to help those individuals, uh, we'll go above and beyond to do that. So thank you. Thanks, Keith. I appreciate it. Uh, next, we have Miss Lisa Moore. Hello, my name is Lisa Moore. I'm with Moore Medicare Options. I have an office at the Sunshine Senior Center in downtown. And uh, what I do is I help all Medicare recipients understand Medicare, find plans and benefits, and then use the plans and benefits to understand what, what that entails. And um, I'm very happy to be here to be part of the falls prevention because many times it's insurance that will pay for these uh, types of services that Medicare recipients receive. And so it's important for me to be part of the conversation and part of the solution and providing information and matching the needs within the community to the benefits that a person might have through Medicare or through a Medicare insurance plan. Thanks, Lisa. And last but definitely not least, uh, we have Rainy Ames. <laughs> thank you, Brett. And thank you, Jillian, for putting this together and this whole uh, panel for, for being here today. We're very uh, honored to be here. As producers, we sort of think of ourselves as journalists, and so we stand in for every man, for regular people. And uh, in our uh, work, we were working on a project on helping people live uh, more interesting and thriving lives as they aged. And we learned very quickly that uh, falls are a very uh, big factor in changing things for the worse for most folks. I was very surprised. I won't tell you my age, but I'll just tell you I'm in a fall risk category, a thing I did not know. Um, like everyone, we have lost people we cared about uh, to the consequences of falls. So um, we're really here today to uh, because we want to spread the word. We want to share the opinions of these experts and we want to help people understand that fall prevention starts earlier. Um, and that again, this physical activity, but also awareness of other things um, is really key. So that's why we're glad to be here today as, uh, as longtime public interest journalists and uh, are just honored to be with Pinellas Park. Thanks, Rainey. So uh, let's start talking about fall prevention in detail. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Apple. Um, so what do you see with fall prevention commonly in the emergency room? So I, by the time the patient gets to the emergency room or your loved one gets to the emergency room, unfortunately, it's usually too late, right? I see, I see the side effects of falls. I see the injuries. Um, I have the conversations with family members about, you know, will their loved one be able to go home now because of uh, injuries to knees, to hips, to wrists? And how much that just takes away from independence and, um, and how much pain the patient is able to be in. So by the time it gets to the emergency department, a lot of times I feel like it's almost too late. But the reality is it's never too late. Um, but the hope through this is that there can be a discussion early enough. Even when you think maybe, ah, I'm too young for that. I don't need to worry about that. That's when you start thinking about it. You know, look around, see if you have blue shrugs, see if you have uh, wires. You know, it's Christmas time. So we all have our Christmas trees up and wires that maybe be in a bad areas um, or a little dog cat, things that can trip you up 
and not by any, you know, not by being careless. It just, it happens, unfortunately. So now's the time to start thinking about it um, at all ages and to help prevent um, you ending up as a patient of mine in the emergency department. Thanks, Dr. Apple. So, uh, Arthur, um, help our audience understand what medications can do to balance and coordination uh, and how can medications affect falls? Sure. Well, to revisit what I first said, there are three common groups of medications that can cause falls, increase the risk of falls. Medications for pain, medications for anxiety, and medications for blood pressure. Medications that reduce pain and anxiety can cause a slowing of our brain activity. The results of this can be a patient will feel drowsy, confused, have lethargy, muscle weakness, and lack of coordination. Now, in more serious cases, a patient can experience a slowed heart rate and shallow breathing. Medications to reduce blood pressure can also cause drowsiness and fatigue, along with lightheadedness, blurred vision, and feeling faint. These are all things that can increase the risk of a patient losing their coordination and falling. Now, unfortunately, what compounds this risk is that very often a patient is taking more than one of these medications at a time. So for an example, pain can often cause anxiety. So a patient may be taking one or two medications for pain along with an anti-anxiety medication. Each time we add a medication to the mix, our risk increases because the side effects are additive. And in addition to that, many people take more than one medication to control their blood pressure. So again, the possibility of side effects increases, drowsiness, fatigue, confusion, and a faint feeling all add up to increasing our risk of falls. Thanks, uh, Arthur. I appreciate that. Um, we do have a question uh, from a caller. Go ahead, Jill. Thank you. Jim, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay. Can you go ahead and ask your question to the panel? Uh, yes, my name is Jim Alimo. I'm the president of the Homeowners Association in Golden Gate, and I'm sitting here with three other directors watching your program on the computer. And our question to the panel is, what can we do to help someone who has fallen in our community? Anybody want to jump on that question? Um, I just to start off. Go ahead, Arlene. I'm sorry. Um, it's a proven fact that people who have fallen have a 40% chance of falling again. So the biggest thing that you can do is to have a risk assessment done in their home um, and encourage them uh, to do both a physical and an environmental risk assessment um, to determine uh, things that they need to do to uh, safe proof their home um, and things that they may physically need to improve on uh, to not fall again. I completely agree. And that's the beauty of this panel is that there's so many aspects to fall prevention. It's looking physically at your home. It's talking to your physician or your pharmacist about medication, <clears throat> talking about maybe getting strength, working with a, a physical therapist, all things that are very important to help identify what needs are there to help fall um, not happen again. I'd like to piggyback off of uh, what Mr. Walker mentioned earlier about active individuals have about a 10% chance of falling, which is a lot less than uh, folks who aren't uh, active. Um, you can uh, recommend that they, if they're physically able to, recommend them come to the senior center and get involved in some of the activities that we have that improve uh, balance and their, and their risk of fall. We have Tai Chi classes and other classes that would definitely help uh, lower that risk. You know, I have a question as, as well about the absolute in the immediate <laughs> aftermath, which I think is a thing that um, that might be helpful from for the chief and Jillian and Dr. Apple to talk about. If someone has fallen themselves or around someone who has fallen, what is the first thing that they do if they're alone? And what should people do to help them? So, um, sure, I can jump on that a little bit of what to do when you first uh, fall. So the first thing to do when you fall, I think, is is just to take a minute. Um, let yourself orient yourself and uh, deal with the fact that you just fell. Um, don't panic. Uh, don't freak out. Uh, you'll probably be in pain. Uh, 
but see if that pain starts going away or if you start recognizing that you have a serious injury, whether it's an arm injury, a leg injury, a hip injury, which, uh, and that type of uh, a thing. Don't try to get up immediately. Let yourself get oriented, let yourself get your bearings of where you are and just deal with, uh, start to deal with the situation. Um, you want to assess yourself for injury. You know, is my arm hurting? Is my head hurting? Is my hip hurting? Um, and do I think I can get uh, to a position where I could, am I able to get myself up or do I need to get 911? Um, if you're alone, uh, I suggest, you know, my mother uh, is 86 years old and she's not allowed anywhere without her cell phone. Um, she also has a call on her neck um, to make sure that if she can't get herself back up, if she does fall or have an emergency, she can get a hold of some, get a hold of 911 right away. Um, uh, if you think you can get up, uh, you can make your way to a position uh, and get up on your knees. If you can work, if you can, if there's a chair nearby, that's one of the easiest uh, ways to help yourself up. Get up, get up on your knees and push yourself up with the chair. But make sure that you're not injured, you're not still dizzy, you haven't hit your head, uh, that type of thing. Um, does anybody have anything else to add? Hey, this is Jackie, and I would love to kind of take what you just said and put a little bit of a prevention spin on it. Um, as a physical therapist, one of the things that um, I can do is help teach that person a floor transfer, which is what we call floor transfer, or a floor recovery plan. Um, so it sounds very important, a floor recovery plan. But part of that is to figure out and understand um, if, if you can get on the floor and how you might do that and what are your surroundings that could help you um, get off the floor. And so it's, a, it's um, in my opinion, I think it's a better time to voluntarily practice that when, um, when you're not injured. Um, something that I, I also want to share is that many people who call emergency medical services sometimes call for help off the floor and they have not sustained an injury. Um, so, so what a valuable way to kind of reduce the need for that kind of call um, and empower yourself to be able to get off the floor on your own uh, in a voluntary way. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Anybody else have anything before we go to the next question? All right, Jillian, I believe we have another question. Yes, sir. This next question will be for Arthur. And we have Mary on the line from Pinellas Park. Mary, can you go ahead with your question? Sure. Um, I heard you talking about prescription medication that may contribute to falls, but is there over-the-counter medication that might uh, also contribute to the falls? Yes, unfortunately there are, Mary. There are several different types. A lot of the cough and cold preparations may have some ingredients in them that can increase the risk of falls. There are over-the-counter medications that help you relax and help you sleep. Uh, products that don't, it's hard to name any given product, but something like NyQuil that promises a good night's sleep also promises to get you drowsy before you go to sleep. So th these things can also increase the risk of falls. Now they may not be as strong as prescription medications in some cases, but if a patient is already taking a prescription medication that can increase the risk of falls, I want to emphasize that yes, it can be additive. One plus one equals a greater risk than either one alone. Uh, a little follow up on that, Arthur. So, what would a person do uh, if they needed a? How would the person get uh, someone to look at their medications, make sure that they don't have a a mixture, a bad mixture, or, or two medications that may counteract, not counteract, but act together? Uh, with each other that might cause them a problem? Well, I know that sometimes a patient's contact with their physician or pharmacist may be limited, but this is critically important because many seniors, it's not unusual for seniors to be taking three, four, five, or six different medications all at the same time that can increase their risk of falls. So it would be ideal to spend the time with their pharmacist or their physician, go over the medications, try to assess their risk of falls, and then try to do something about that. Try to reduce the amount of medications that they need to take that can increase their risk. They really need to have a good review by a physician or a pharmacist 
in order to assess it. It's very, very important. And primarily because of the large number of medications that any one person might be taking that can cause these problems. And Arthur, Thanks. if I could just piggyback on that real quick. Perdon. A lot of times patients have multiple physicians that they go to, maybe a heart specialist, a lung specialist, yep. et cetera. And sometimes it can get very uh, easy to maybe not realize that one doctor is putting you on this and another doctor is putting you on this. So um, yep. try to make sure that that's being very clear. And a pharmacist is a great way to kind of you know look at everything all together and make sure that there's not doubling up on medications. Um, Absolutely. Yep. Using it as a focal point, certainly. And that was not necessarily a big issue a long time ago. But now it is common that patients have up to maybe three different providers that are all trying to do the right thing, but there's certainly going to be crossover inevitably. And uh, yes. adding on to that, people also uh, now with uh, pharmacy costs will go to multiple pharmacies. Uh, I know things like GoodRx and that, you can find different prices at different pharmacies, so they'll take one prescription to a pharmacy and another one, so you don't have that pharmacist that has their full list of medications and can view and see whether one counteracts the other or causes problems of uh, you know, combining. <clears throat> I'd also like to add um, one of the best um, things that I saw is if a person writes the list of all their medications or actually take your bottles when you go to see your primary care doctor. So your primary care doctor should know all the medications, all the supplements that you're taking, all the over-the-counter medications that you're taking. It's a good idea. You can either take all your bottles or you can make a list. And when you make a list, it's important to put down the dosage of the medication and the frequency with which you're taking it. So if you have a complete list with you, then you're able to share that not only with your primary care doctor, which I believe is the most important, but also you're able to show that to specialists uh, if you have multiple specialists. Good point. Excellent. Yeah, as well as EMS when they, if they have to come to your home. Uh, mm -hmm. Correct. And one great tip that I want to add, um, our Pinellas Park Fire Department has a telemedic program. And what that is, it's essentially your voice when you don't have one. We have these little magnets that you can place on your refrigerator and it has a little pocket in it. And with the pocket, we have, you can add all of your medical information, including your medications, any prior surgeries, any prior medical health um, situations that you've had. And you fold it up and you place it inside of this little envelope, this little magnet place it on your refrigerator. All of our first responders in the Pinellas County area are trained to look on your refrigerator for this no. information and you will no. be able to, um, they'll be able to know all of your um, medical history and everything else. So it's essentially your voice when you don't have one. If you're looking for that, you can always contact me, um, Jillian Rose at jrose at pinellas-park.com and I'll make sure you get one, or you can call me at 727-369-5812. And to add to that, Jillian, I think that it would be important to say that the patient should have that list, a copy of that list on that person, their significant other should have a copy of that list, and each of that providers should have a copy of that list. All right, um, I believe we have another question, Jillian? We have a Jill, caller named Linda on the line, and Linda has a question for us. Go ahead, Linda. Okay. Um, the fire chief started the show uh, mentioning lower body strength. And before COVID, I was an active walker, and I participated in group exercises. But now with COVID and fall season, um, flu season, I'm staying inside all the time. I don't go out unless I have to, like a doctor appointment or whatever. And I feel that I am losing strength, uh, lower body strength. So what can I safely do as exercise in my home and know I'm not going to hurt myself and I don't have need someone to watch me to make sure I'm doing it absolutely 100% correctly. I want to protect my lower body strength. I am going to let Jackie uh, start off with that one, if that's all right. Of course. Thank you, Linda, for your question. I think it's on a lot of our minds how to stay fit when you can't go where you want to go. Um, one 
one thing I'll say first is that there are a lot of resources now. Um, maybe there's a silver lining of COVID, I don't know. But because of COVID, there are a lot of video-based resources now. Um, and these can be found on the National Council on Aging website, as well as other websites like um, the American Physical Therapy Association websites. <clears throat> um, and so, so something that, um, that might be tangible, like a takeaway that you could utilize today, and of course, this is something that I, I should, I suppose, put a disclaimer on in that I um, am not recommending that this is a particular exercise for any person, but if you believe that this is something you could do, um, I would be in support of it. So, so we get up and down out of a chair multiple times a day, presumably. Um, in, one, in, in, in several studies, actually, there's a, a marker of kind of health status in that if you can rise from a chair at least one time without using your hands um, to support your ascent up out of the chair, um, then that's an indicator that your, your lower leg strength is, is good. Um, so where possible, and if you feel capable, I think it's appropriate to say, okay, every time I, I go to stand up, I'm going to try to do it without pushing up with my hands. Um, and as that's successful, why don't you go ahead and do that 10 more times? Um, and so if that occurs three or four times through the day, you've done 30 to 40 sit to stands um, over and above what you would typically do. Uh, and so that's a, a fairly simple way to, to keep that, um, that kind of activity going um, when, when you're not able to, to do what you'd want to do in your regular routine. Andrew, I'm sure you have some uh, good ideas for this. So I would say that uh, in addition to the National Council on Aging um, website, um, our website, the uh, National Senior Games Association, NSGA.com, we have advanced and basic balance uh -huh. exercises that you can do. Um, and, and so you, you have that variety there. Uh, so strengthening is important, flexibility is important, and then practicing balance itself. Um, you, if you have a chair, uh, you can uh, brace yourself or support yourself uh, on the chair and uh, practice standing uh, on one leg um, uh, in a safe manner. Uh, so again, the, it's very important for you to practice your, your balance. So strength, flexibility, and balance. Flexibility-wise, I would uh, work on ankle flexibility and make make sure you're doing some ankle rotations, um, tapping your toe uh, and heel, um, that sort of thing. So those are a couple of simple things you can do. I'd like to add on too, with um, when it comes to insurance, many Medicare Advantage plans and even some Medicare supplements offer an additional uh, benefit called Silver Sneakers. And Silver Sneakers has all types of online activities that are designed for the senior community for Medicare beneficiaries and does have uh, offer you a lot of resources and also community. Right, can I add one thing as well? Yeah, absolutely, Keith. All right, I'm not sure where the caller uh, lives in Pinellas Park, but um, in the northern, the middle, and the southern part of the, the city, we do have um, outdoor fitness equipment. Um, based on your your uh, your fitness level or um, how comfortable you are with using those uh, those fitness equipment outdoor fitness equipment, um, those could help you as well. We also have walking tracks where you can stay distance from people, and those are all online um, on the city of Pinellas Park's website to help you locate those. Yes, for Silver Sneakers, you would just go to silversneakers.com. You would take your insurance card, enter your information, and if you have that benefit, you'll pop up in their system. And they will offer uh, also offer you um, the opportunity to participate in outdoor activities. Um, they have Gladiator Camp, and many uh, facilities have now introduced outdoor activity where you can exercise socially distance, but also it'll have a lot of um, It'll have a lot of videos and, and classes that you can participate on in online. I would also say that Keith's uh, Tai Chi program, uh, if you're in the area, um, uh, that's one of the best uh, uh, and more effective ways to prevent falls. Actually, that's how I got involved in falls prevention, or that's how falls prevention 
got me into Tai Chi. So, um, uh, so those evidence-based classes. So uh, Keith's program, uh, Tai Chi is an evidence-based program. That's the other thing I would look for. Um, a Matter mm -hmm. of Balance, that's another program. And there are a couple of physical therapy uh, related programs um, that have also been evidence-based um, uh, and proven. Uh, evidence-based just means uh, there's a body of evidence that shows that you will definitely improve as opposed to um, by chance you might improve. These have been proven to be effective. Um, Azalea Rec Center, uh, Pinellas County, uh, that's where I study Tai Chi with um, a really good instructor. So the uh, Pinellas County and City of St. Pete, they also have uh, Tai Chi programs. And I have a question for Dr. Apple about this. Are you seeing uh, increased risk or things you didn't see before in the ER because of isolation and lack of movement? Uh, out there? I, I believe I have. There's been, you know, COVID's multifaceted. Of course, we're seeing COVID cases, um, but in addition, seeing maybe some more interactions with medications because um, they're having a difficult time getting in to see a primary care doctor and, and, you know, trying to figure out the best balance of medications. They're monitoring blood pressures at home and, you know, just kind of the, the multiple facets of things that go on with it. People that maybe feel a little more depressed or down because they're unable to be with loved ones as much as they would like to be and therefore leading to maybe spending a little more time, you know, alone. Um, it's kind of like a, right, a, a circle that kind of turns on itself. So I think the biggest thing is something that we're all kind of learning through this, even myself, is figuring out things that you can do instead of things you can't do. And a lot of times you get into the mindset, well, at least I do, if, if I can't do it X, Y, and Z way, the way I've always done it, then I can't do it at all. And um, kind of stepping back and thinking, you know what, I can't go to the fitness class that I like to do, but I can walk around the block. And maybe I have to walk around the block, you know, more times than what what I would be if I was able to go to the fitness class, then that's okay. Or maybe right now I'm only in the mood or feel up to walking around the block once, and that's also okay. So allowing yourself to just be active in some way, shape, or form, just be active is going to be a huge important thing for not only your physical health, but also for your mental health. Thanks, everybody. Um, do we have another question, Jill? Yes, Chief, we do. We have Jane from Pinellas Park, and she is ready to give her question to the panel. Jane, go ahead and ask your question. Okay, my question is, um, you mentioned making modifications to your home to make it safer from falls. Um, what are the best ones that are either low cost or even free? So, uh, Arlene, will you start with that? Maybe you can talk about uh, the home assessment uh, as well, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, my daughter and I volunteer for the AARP's uh, Home Fit program, uh, which does a complete home assessment via a, a book. Or we, we, of course, used to do presentations. We have presented this program to hundreds of people in Pinellas County. Uh, with low cost, no cost ideas uh, to stay safe in your home. One of the uh, simple things are always looking uh, for uneven floor surfaces. Um, there are threshold ramps and please remember that you can trip on an eighth of an inch difference in your flooring, an eighth of an inch. So um, that's uh, extremely important. Um, throw rugs, either remove them or make sure that they're securely tacked down. Um, I always like to say throw out the throw rugs. It's a little bit severe, but they do cause a lot of accidents. Um, be mindful of your small pets. They can get tangled up in your feet and you sometimes don't realize it, but they do cause falls. So always be mindful. Bending and stretching are two things you have to be aware of. When you bend down or stretch up, you can lose your balance through medication imbalance or other things. So. Um, Always, uh, there's so many different things you can do to your home to avoid um, uh, the bending and stretching unsafely. Um, and uh, certainly lighting. 
lighting is very important. Um, handrails and grab bars are some simple things you can do, inexpensive things you can do, but they should be done by a professional. We see way too many people that use those suction cup grab bars and please do not use them. They do cause falls. Mold gets behind the uh, suction cup uh, mechanism and it makes it very slippery and it's and the manufacturer will even tell you in the instructions this was not intended to be weight bearing so please have a um, securely fastened um, handrail and grab bar wherever necessary you know that's uh, really important to uh around roughly 80% of falls are bathroom or in the bathroom, um, which is exactly what you were talking about with grab bars. Uh, lighting is another huge one. We go out at night constantly for people that fell. Uh, you think you know where you're going or you think you're oriented. When you come up out of bed, um, there's, a, there's a process to orienting and you need light to orient yourself and balance yourself. And a lot of people will get up. They don't want to turn on the light. Maybe they don't want to disturb their significant other by having a light. Um, so there are several light options. Uh, Jillian did a great uh, little program at one of our ALFs, and they installed lighting that it just orients you to up and down. So that's just, I believe they were red and green, and they were motion activated. So when you got, when you sat up, they came on, and they just helped you orient yourself. Um, the other big thing we see clean up the water. When you spill water, it needs to get wiped up. Uh, you come back through that area and it was a little puddle of water and you slip and fall on that. Jill, we got any other questions? I don't see the question card. No question, sir. Can... <laughs> if I could add on to that, some Medicare Advantage plans do offer you over-the-counter, and sometimes in their over-the-counter, they will have some bathroom safety equipment that you're able to get for free. Um, you, of course, as Arlene has has always, has educated me, you never want to go with the suction cup, but sometimes they'll have a raised toilet seat or they'll have um, grab bars are supports that are grounded to the ground and so they can they can help in bathroom or a bathroom shower seat or something that helps a person transition from the bath and out of the bath great you know and another thing I wanted to add to that too never be embarrassed about having to use any type of that medical equipment sometimes I often hear oh I I don't want to use my walker it makes me look old or you know, if that's the case and it's come down to the time where you need to use a medical assisted device, try to get them in like a color you like. Like if you're, you know, get a pink one or get one that has a, you know, a leopard print or something that's going to make you feel more comfortable. It's, it's much cooler to be safe than it is to, you know, than it is what you think people are getting a perception of you using the equipment. We, uh, we, we never want you to be embarrassed about having to use a device like that. Um, the other thing, Jackie, could you talk a little bit about the appropriate use of some of those items, a walker, a cane, uh, some of those assisted items? Sure. Um, you know, a, a walker or a cane, they come in many shapes and sizes in addition to colors. Um, some are adjustable, some have bases on them, some have multiple wheels, some have seats. Um, and uh, many times I will meet individuals who have been gifted an assistive device from a family member or a spouse or a neighbor that no longer needs it or something like that. And so I see a lot of individuals who use devices that weren't fit well for them. Um, and so, so part of, um, part of a, a, an assessment um, from a physical therapist could include, let's find out what kind of device if any, works for you. So there's not one answer, unfortunately, to how to choose one, um, because it really does depend on if it's adjustable and whether you'd use it in your right or left hand, or if you'd use it through a narrow space versus a wider space. Um, there's outdoor wheels versus wheels that are you know, more um, easy to slide over a rug or a tile versus maybe a gravel driveway or something. So it is kind of a complicated, 
prescription, if you will, to kind of figure out um, the device that might work best for you. Um, I will say though that, you know, sometimes um, a, a rollator comes to mind. This is a, a, a walker, usually four wheels, that has a seat. Um, and those were never intended to be, those seats were really never intended to be sat on while moving the device, right? Sometimes it's used as a, maybe like a, a stool <laughs> where you'd sit on the seat and use your feet to kind of pull yourself along. Um, I've worked with several people who've had unfortunate falls off of their rollator because of, because of you know, uh, using it in an appropriate way. So, um, so I guess the message is if, if you're unsure about what kind of device to get, um, sometimes a, 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 a touch point with a physical therapist, even for one or two visits um, to answer those kinds of questions um, is, can be very helpful. Absolutely, I just have to echo that because uh, you know you have, um, I guess, uh, ep so, well, I wouldn't say epidemic, but there are people who self-prescribe um, devices and um, they're not using them correctly. And so, seeing a physical therapist, I have to echo that um, uh, is very important. Uh, I have experienced that directly. Uh, it's hard to untrain um, someone who's uh, been using a, a, a device a certain way without uh, instru proper instruction, and um, and they practice incorrectly, and it really is a challenge to to help them clarify that. And then uh, OT is important um, for um, making it easy around your home, uh, having an occupational therapist do an assessment of your living space, and and then. Um, the there are um, again on the National Council of Aging uh, site there are checklists that are available for you to do an assessment um, of multiple aspects. You know, falls prevention is a multi-faceted uh, um, uh, issue, and um, so it ha has to be dealt with holistically. And then Medicare does have resources. Um, they even provide a health screening. Um, uh, you know, when you first sign up, I believe there is a wellness check that's complimentary. They're doing a lot better job at working on prevention and uh, a falls assessment can be a part of that. All right. I would, I would say to Andrew that yes, Medicare um, does have services that are both preventative and they have ones that they consider medically necessary. But for a person who might need PT or OT in order to use a new device, um, you would contact your primary care doctor and they can give you a referral to a physical therapist or an occupational therapist so that you can learn to use the durable medical equipment or the cane or the walker that you have. That is something that is covered by Medicare. And the best way to, um, to do it is to reach out to your primary care doctor. Thanks. May I just also add, um, uh, this is Jackie again. Sorry that I can't see you all. Um, there is a, um, a, a direct access um, to physical therapists. Um, and so I appreciate the comment from Lisa about um, going through your physician, which I think is very appropriate. Um, sometimes, depending on the um, both the insurance and the provider, um, you could go directly to a physical therapist. Um, and so there's unfortunately at this time kind of a, an asterisk that's com that comes after that statement because while Medicare might cover your services through direct access, it may be that your primary care physician or some part of an Advantage plan or some detail that says, well, we still require a referral from the physician. Um, so, so in the event that your, that your plan does allow for you to directly access a physical therapist, what that means really is that by law in Florida, the physical therapist has 30 days to communicate um, written in a written way with your physician to share that you have sought the services of a physical therapist. And so that, that provision, that direct access provision is fairly new in our profession. 
uh, of physical therapy and something that not everyone is aware of. And so it does still have um, some caveats um, as far as um, what actual type of plan, uh, um, payment plan that you, you have. Um, and so to find that out, you would, you would discuss um, the details of your plan um, you know, with someone like Lisa, um, or hopefully to figure out through your um, healthcare providers if direct access is, is a mechanism that you can utilize. So yes, Jackie, I would say that um, if an individual is on an HMO, you will require a referral to see a physical therapist. Um, and it is the best way to go through your physician um, in order to ensure that you'll receive payment. However, if you're on a PPO plan, which allows you to see specialists without a referral, you will fall into a, a gray category. And if you're on straight Medicare or a Medicare supplement, then that would probably be the most appropriate for this direct access. And I agree with you that sometimes when things are new, the insurance companies work work slowly. So, um, so it's always good to have a good working relationship with your primary care doctor. And once you have a good establishment, then you'll find that it, it should be easy for you to get the referrals that you need to, to the the healthcare professionals that are important to you and that you need. Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Uh, I believe we have uh, another question, Jill. Yes. Yes, sir, we do. We have Jim from Pinellas Park here with a great question for our panel. Uh, my question for the panel is we've been trying to keep notes on all the great information that we've got from everybody. But I was wondering if you would consider uh, after this meeting at some time to list the web, all the websites that uh, various people have uh, mentioned um, so that the, we can go there at our leisure and click on them to see uh, what uh, additional information that we could get because uh, it's, it's, it's real hard to write down all the website names as people are saying them. Absolutely. I'm and let I Jillian can... answer that. Yep. Go ahead, Jill. <laughs> So, so yes, so today's show is actually being recorded and we have plans to um, release this to our community starting in January. So we will make sure that we will um, watch it again and get all of the, um, get all of the information and as they're talking, add those websites and contact information. Thank you, Jim, for your question. And uh, we'll make sure that that's up on the uh, Pinellas Park. Those uh, websites are uh, listed on the Pinellas Park Fire Department website as well as the city website. And Jillian's taking a question right now. I uh, I have a question for uh, who I have a question for. I have a question for Keith Sabil, so uh, Junior. Um, we want our senior community to stay active. Um, what are the safer? Uh, what are some of the safer activities that we have in the community? I know you mentioned a few, uh, and uh, that Leisure Services uh, has offered. And how have you uh, changed what you do in some of the areas to make it safe? All right. So first of all, we do work with um, the area aging or area agency on aging, as well as the uh, National Council on Aging, um, to identify safe activities uh, for the seniors. We do, um, I believe uh, Mr. Walker mentioned earlier, uh, Matter of Balance. We uh, do help individuals connect with Matter of Balance trainers uh, in the area. At the rec center, we offer um, evidence-based trainings like Tai Chi, um, and we can put uh, folks in contact with um, other evidence-based trainings in the area if they need to uh, stepping on and otago as well feel free to contact the uh, the senior center for those uh, those programs and more information um, in, in the community uh, we talked about safety and, and walking if you are walking anywhere in the city of pinellas park and you see any discrepancies any cracks in the concrete please feel free to uh, contact the public works um, department. They will go out and, and fix those areas. We also do a, um, we have a consultant come in who goes out and uh, 
you know, basically surveys all of our sidewalks to identify those unsafe areas um, throughout the city. But if you see anything, please feel free to, to uh, contact us and we'll get on it right away. And um, looks like Jill has a question. Go ahead, Jill. Thank you. I actually have Chrissy on the line and she has a question for the panel. Go ahead, Chrissy. Uh, yes, I was just wondering um, what details should we be paying attention to regarding our feet or our shoes, our footwear um, that might indicate we're starting to have um, some issues with balance because of conditions with our feet or our shoe wear? Anybody want to jump on that one? Um, I, I can help out a little bit with that. Um, we do have, um, not currently because of uh, COVID, but we do have uh, health fairs at the senior center. And when we do have those health fairs, we do have a podiatrist on site that can help with those types of questions. So I'd say at this point, probably contact a podiatrist and, um, you know, or let them know what concerns you're having. They can help you out. There are also resources that you can, and Andrea would know as well, the kinds of footwear, footwear that stays laced up. But really one of the best things you can do is uh, get in touch with people like Jillian, like with people like Andrea, speak to your physical therapist, speak to someone like Arlene Grasso, who is trained in fall prevention awareness uh, about footwear. Footwear is actually a really big problem. Um, we've all done it. And uh, Andrea is going to jump in. Yeah, just two quick things. One thing that you can look at is the treads on your shoes. If you find that the treads are wearing down, then that means that you're not going to have as much friction and put you at increased risk for falls. And we're all Floridians here, right? So we love our uh, flip flops or sliders, whatever you want to call them. But um, it is much better to have a nice closed toe shoe that um, Velcro's over, ties up, and gives you nice support. Um, can be less, uh, less risk for falls. Um, I couldn't agree more about the sliders and the flip-flops. I think sometimes a, a common comment is that it's easier, um, maybe because of some other changes, to slip on a shoe um, uh, that doesn't have um, a back and, or a flip-flop, right? Um, and so there are kind of adaptive pieces of equipment like laces that are elastic that are already tied um, or uh, different kinds of shoes that have um, different types of straps. Um, you know, that that a physical therapist could likely help you identify. Um, one other comment about kind of the foot and an assessment that a physical therapist can do is um, to understand if you have any limitations um, in the range of motion available at your ankle joint and your toe, your, your big toe. Um, interestingly, sometimes stiffness in those joints can really make a big impact on your stability. Um, and so that's that's just one example of, of, of something that a physical therapist could, could look at in the context of your, your foot health and your shoe wear. And then one other kind of kind of quick self-assessment you might be able to do is, is if in bare feet you notice that your foot kind of collapses towards the middle, towards the inside, that could indicate that there is some weakness around some muscles of the arch and the ankle of the foot. Um, and that requires some very specific strengthening types of activities or um, some support like orthotics. Um, and again, a, a podiatrist and a physical therapist can um, be very valuable members of a team to help you kind of figure out um, how to get more support for your foot. Dr. Apple, if you had to say avoid a particular kind of footwear, if you could just be like, please don't wear this type of shoe. Do you see things in the ER that re are related to falls caused by people's footwear? I, I do. And I'm actually thinking back even to my own uh, grandmother because she would say, ah, you know, they're easy. Just put on the flip flops and take care of it. And we would get after her because definitely had a higher risk for falls. And we do see that too. People are at the beach or at the pool and have on flip flops and um, they definitely don't provide the support and they're much more slippery um, and will increase your risk of fall. 
And the other thing I wanted to add to that as well too, you know, we could be wearing the, the proper shoes, but we have to make sure that the, we're wearing the proper socks. So if we're taking off our shoes and gonna be walking around with our socks, we wanna make sure that they have some type of non-slip grip or we're changing into a pair of non-slip slippers. In addition, I think she mentioned, um, I thought the caller talked about conditions and one condition would be uh, diabetes and uh, Dr. Apple, uh, uh, Jackie could speak to that with uh, peripheral uh, neuropathies and lack of sensation. Um, you know, those could be contributing uh, factors too, uh, possibly. I'm gonna share a personal a story. Uh, uh -huh. My father found that he could not, uh, when he was driving, he was not able to adequately feel uh, the, the controls in his car and he realized he had some age-related neuropathy and started wearing um, footwear that's kind of designed for rock climbing and pretty aggressive outdoor trekking but it, it gives a little bit of support but also allows you to feel where you're going and I see so many people now uh, they walk around in their house on carpet in very heavy sneakers or heavy shoes and of course you have no contact with the floor and I'm like mm. That just seems like a recipe for disaster. Well, and I think a lot of this with the neuropathy, the idea of having the strength and filing with physical therapy and um, allowing that proprioception or ability to know kind of where you're at in space, your, your balance training is so important, even more so when you don't have all your senses as fully uh, functional as they could be. Yeah, you know, another kind of, um, activity that a physical therapist can help with is, is helping to problem solve, <clears throat> excuse me, when some, um, you know, what, what a typical day or evening might look like for you. And so one um, example that came to mind as you all were speaking is um, the idea that, that maybe you don't think about wearing a pair of shoes to get up out of bed to walk to your bathroom. Um, and so, and so you could, you know, kind of problem solve what is, what is, the type of, of grippy slipper um, or shoe that you could slip on to you know be safe in your in your walk to the bathroom, um, and, and so you know it's just one time frame sometimes that we may not think about until you're in it um, that is a, a very important contributor to um, to the, the footwear story um, and and the comment that was made earlier about many falls happening um, in the bathroom I think. Um, and many falls also happen on the way to the bathroom. Well, thanks. Uh, Jillian, do you have any more questions for us? Can I add no, one more? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Go ahead. Um, and that is uh, high heel shoes. I'm not sure if that is, I mean, I'm not the expert <laughs> on that. So I, I know we didn't mention that, so I don't, you, you know, not sure what to say. That, that's a good point. Uh, you talked about earlier about uh, strengthening the ankle strengthening and stretching and things like that. And just, you know, as your strength goes down, uh, you don't lift your feet as well. That's just the reality, right? As, as you get older, you see more and more people shuffling. You shuffle, shuffle, you don't lift your feet as high. That's why you get caught on the carpets. So it really doesn't matter what kind of shoes you wear sometimes. If you're not lifting your feet, they're all gonna catch on an obstruction. Um, so, uh, you know, it goes back and being important with strengthening and exercise. Um, but yeah, I would, high heels, I'll go out on the limb and say that's a bad <laughs> idea as you get older. Um, I, I cannot yeah. agree more. You know, you know, Andrew, thanks for bringing that up. I think. Um, something that we have to remember is, you know, the the hip bones connected to the knee bone is connected to something else, right? And so, so uh, many times you you address the footwear and and back pain goes away, or right. um, you know, the, so I just think there's so much opportunity for kind of um, I don't know, getting a tune up maybe is the best way to put it um, to to really. Um, have the the fitness assessment, have a, a physical assessment, um, whether it be through your primary care or through a physical therapist, um, to to really um, kind of get a, get some information about what parts of your body could 
could really use a little tune up. Um, and I do think that some of, uh, some of that effort would most definitely affect someone's fall risk. I can uh, I can only speak as a as a woman who likes to wear high heel shoes, <laughs> um, and I know that they do they do accent our our outfits. But I do find for myself that um, as as I get older, I do tend to choose shoes that are heels, but they're lower and they have a fatter heel. So I don't use ones that are really spiky like I used to. I look for the ones that are fatter but still give me a little a bit of elevation. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you, no other callers, Jill? No. I, I do have a, um, a call that came in earlier. Um, someone was asking you, Chief, what do you think our Pinellas Park first responders see as a cause for falls in our community, a common cause of falls? Um, I think the uh, I think the co a very common cause of falls, uh, one is the strength. Um, you just see people tripping because they're not lifting their feet. They get a little bit older and they just don't, you lose that strength. Um, you know, people shuffle their feet a lot and uh, they just, you just lose it. It just happens. Um, and you have to work to uh, maintain that strength to be able to lift your feet. And then the other thing is in the dark. Doing things in the dark uh, is a bad idea, even when you're young. Um, you know, how many times, uh, you know, People hit the, how many times over the years did you hit your shins? Did you hit your toes? Did you catch the door because you were trying to walk in the dark? Um, I have po a bunch of pocket doors in my house, right? And all you know always somebody leaves it one inch open and you run into it when it's uh, in the dark. Um, so uh, use lights, use night lights, use uh, whatever can get you oriented and see where you're going uh, and see what you're doing. Uh, don't try to remember that, uh, you know, my, I'll go on a personal experience. My mother, she's 86. She does the back in method when she goes to the bathroom, right? She goes, walks, turns around and backs in until she feels the toilet and then sits down. Well, there was a time when she was having uh, some urinary problems and she had to uh, use a bedside commode. Well, she tried back doing the back in method, knocked it over, fell, broke her arm. Uh, so uh you know pay attention to what you're doing uh of course she was doing it in the middle of the night in the in the dark so uh but paying attention to what you're doing but don't do stuff in the dark um uh, get some light on the situation and it'll really help orient you i actually have night lights in my house that i got from the city of pinellas park so <laughs> so if we don't have any other cars, if we don't have any other callers, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close, uh, go to our close out question here. Um, so for this is for the panel. If you could urge people to do one thing to prevent a fall, what would it be? Um, I'm going to start with Dr. Apple. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this, uh, this group. I think it's awesome that getting out to the community and having these discussions. And I see everybody has such expertise in this area. And um, as an emergency room physician, I kind of, we're always a little bit of a back of all trades. So I kind of feel like that's my, my role here is, you know, kind of dabbling a little bit of everything. But for me, I think the most important thing is realizing that everyone is, it's never too early. It's never too late um, to go ahead and start thinking about what you can do now for fall prevention. Have it as a discussion with your family, with your brothers, sisters, your mom, your dad, even, you know, even kids. It just, Always have this discussion, have the ideas, talk to your physician, talk to your pharmacist, physical therapy, stay active, all these things that we've been talking about today. I think it's not necessarily one particular thing. It's just having the idea and being prepared. Thanks a lot. Uh, Lisa, same question. So just being able to be part of this community and to um, to hear all the different things to learn and understand how fall prevention is important and how much it affects our senior community and doing what i do the most important thing i feel is to have a really good relationship with your primary care doctor because through your primary care doctor you're going to be able to have preventative services like bone scans vision vision things that keep you overall healthy and then the second the second um, 
part would be uh, to don't be afraid to reach out to your insurance company because there are lots of extra benefits that are meant to support you and many people are not aware. Every plan almost has over the counter, they have silver sneakers. Uh, some plans actually have an emergency response system. And so you might not be aware, but you may have an emergency response system that's free and fully paid for through your Medicare Advantage HMO plan. Um, so don't be afraid to reach out to your insurance companies and have a really good relationship with your primary care doctor. You know, and that's really good. Uh, you know, how many seniors, and I know I've just experienced it for my mom, they try to spend their last couple hundred dollars at the end of the year that they have available on their supplemental plans and things like that. Spend it on fall prevention. Find out what they can get. Don't just buy boxes of stuff that you're going to sit in the corner. Figure out what you need uh, and spend it this year on fall prevention. Uh, yes. Andrew. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lisa. I was, I was just echoing that, that that's true. Sometimes people can maybe order the same things, but your catalog for over the counter might be more comprehensive than what you realize. So don't be afraid to call and ask and get the information. Thanks. Andrew, can you close us out with uh, what you would, uh, your one thing? It's tough because it's almost a trick question because I don't think there is a one one thing. Every so the one thing you should do is act on one of these choices. Uh, now, if I'm pushed, I would say being uh, physically active and walking or any physical activity. There's a there's a relationship between reduction in falls and being physically active. But everybody here, just choose one of these areas that we've talked about and start act, take action. Thanks, Andrew. Jackie, you there? Yes, I'm here, thank you. Um, Andrew, I love that. I, I was sitting here thinking that it must feel overwhelming um, to wonder what to do first. Um, you know, and I, I think there's so much that we didn't actually talk about, like, like the effect of, of vision, you know, we talked about the dark, but what about acuity, you know, and do you need your prescription changed or, or something like that or hearing aids and wearing them on a regular basis and how that might affect your balance. So, so I think I echo what Andrew said, you know, maybe, maybe identify a buddy, whether that's your spouse or your sibling or a, 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 a child, um, a friend, someone to say, you know what, let's, let's put together a fall prevention plan and, and figure out what, what you can tackle first. Because I think a grave mistake would be to um, maybe um, stop short, right? Maybe implement one or two of these really amazing suggestions today and then, and then, and then falsely think that you have um, addressed it, right? Because fall prevention, as we've mentioned, is, or falls are, are, are multifactorial, meaning one thing does not cause all falls. And if, if it did, then we would we would not be here. Um, so so I just want to close by 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 um, by thanking you for for listening and for including me um, and representing physical therapy in this very very important topic. Thanks, Jillian. I think one of the most important things to do is to stay up to date with current fall prevention education. Um, don't be afraid to attend education classes happening in your community. It can be that one new tip that you learn that can help save your life or somebody that you love. Um, make sure that you're clicking like on the Pinellas Park Fire Department's page to stay up to date with our events or going to the City of Pinellas Park website. One of the most, uh, one of the things I value most about our Pinellas Park Fire Department is that we're not just a reactive um, department. We truly want to help prevent falls and keep our community thriving. We have so many people that shy away from talking about fall prevention, and we understand this. Traditional fall prevention education classes are not receiving much response. So we always try to look for new, innovative, educational, and entertaining ways that we can help keep our community um, informed on fall prevention. We partnered with Linda Goldman and Christine Homaker um, with SAGES, their Senior Actors Guild and Education Services. Um, Linda Goldman, at the young age of 70, wrote a phenomenal um, fall prevention play that's put on by seniors. Um, I'll quickly attempt to explain it without giving it a spoiler alert because we hope to do it in our community again. Um, but 
in the um, in the play, the audience is shown what common mistakes are made when it comes to fall prevention and falls. And then we have an opportunity where there is a fatal fall, we get to stop the play and we get to show the audience how everything goes when they're making the correct choices and they're wearing the correct shoes and they're talking to their physical therapist and going to the educational classes. And it was truly amazing how the audience reacted to that play. We heard so many people say, I would have done that. I would have done it. Um, you know, it's, it really was impactful. That play brought 500 people to our um, Performing Arts Center, which is very unusual attention for fall prevention anything. Um, that sparked the attention of our wonderful Chris and Rainey Ames of Ames Production, directed a documentary um, that was filmed on fall prevention, our fall prevention efforts in Pinellas County. Uh, we hosted that at our Performing Arts Center as well, too. We had a great audience. Uh, myself and firefighter EMT Tim Killian also developed and wrote a comedy script with uh, the help of our senior, uh, City of Pinellas Park Senior Center volunteers. And we had the off audience laughing and learning at the same time. Fall prevention education can be very dry, and it's not an easy subject to teach. But we try to think outside of the box and make it as entertaining as possible to get our community to respond and make a difference. Um, the other thing that we're also actively trying to do right now is we formed a special group with City and Pinellas Park employees that are focusing on the needs of older adults in our community. This group is actively working on a resource guide that we're gonna be able to share with our older adult communities to help residents that have experienced a fall um, should they know who to contact. So, you know, just stay up to date, stay informed, you know, contact your fire department's Facebook page, the City of Pinellas Park Facebook's page, just so this way you can get the current and up-to-date educational events. Thanks, Jill. Keith Sabeel. I would just say get active and, and stay active, whether it's in uh, using our, our park system, the walking trail, the fitness centers, going into the senior center, uh, participating in the exercise classes, um, or even utilizing the library to check out a, a Tai Chi video that you can do in, in your house. Just stay active and uh, build those muscles that will prevent, uh, prevent you from falling. Thanks, Keith. Arlene, got anything to close us out with uh, your one thing? Well, it's, it's like a broken record, but the risk assessment is one of the most important things that I think that you can do for your loved one or yourself. Um, it will help you to find out the things in your home that should be changed for you to be able to live there safely. Um, and the physical risk assessment will help you um, uh, target the things that you need to work on um, to be uh, more physically fit to prevent that fall. As a community, uh, we had a call from a community, um, you can um, go to AARP slash HOMEFIT, H-O-M-E-F-I-T. And um, uh, there are many volunteers across the United States. My daughter and I do the Tampa Bay Home Fit programs. We've done them online uh, in Zooming, but we've done, again, hundreds of uh, personal presentations to communities uh, to show them all the different things that they can do um, and, and perform their own risk assessment safely. So um, it's, it's important and our false prevention coalition is also putting together a list of resources because we find that um, the area agency on aging, for example, really doesn't have time to put all these things together. So collectively working uh, with everyone in Pinellas County will be able to give our, all the residents a comprehensive list of their go-tos that they need for questions answered and to stay safe. Thank you for letting me be a part of this. Thanks for being a part of it. I really appreciate it. Rainey, you got any, uh, anything there for your one thing? Embrace your change, your aging. Embrace it and don't be in denial and don't be embarrassed. We need to change this conversation. Fall risk starts a lot earlier than people think it does. And aging is a great opportunity, as they say, compared to the other options. So I think it's really important for people to, it's like, don't be afraid, get going. Don't be in denial. The longer you wait to do something, the harder it is 
and, and just incorporate this. By the way, you know, falls happen to people at all ages and they are devastating to people at all ages. And all the things that prevent falls in aging people, uh, prevent falls in younger people. Falling is a thing that's really, a, it's, it's an awareness thing. It's a basic safety thing like wearing your seatbelt. So don't, don't be in denial, get, get going. Thanks. Arthur, yeah. you, uh, what would be the one thing there you would change? Well, I, first of all, I was asked to be on the panel to offer my expertise, but I have learned so much this morning from all these other experts. <laughs> like, uh, like Andrew says, it's hard to nail it down to one thing, but I'll keep it to two. I insist, talk to your physician, talk to your pharmacist, see if your medications are causing you to be at a risk for falls and work with them to try to reduce the risk. The second thing is the medication list. Have that copy up on the refrigerator, as Jillian said. Have a copy on your person. Have a copy with your significant other. If, unfortunately, you have to make a visit to Dr. Apple, she is going to be so far ahead of the game if she has a list of your medications to start with. Thanks, Arthur. Thank um, you. I'm going to give my uh, my one thing that uh, I see, and I know it's for myself, don't be stubborn. Mm. Be willing to make changes. Don't be stubborn. Um, I am much uh, more stubborn uh, now than I was 20, 25 years ago. Uh, and I'm sure in 25 years from now, I'll be even more stubborn. But this is really, really important. Make the changes. Um, and help prevent just a serious life-changing incident. You don't want to have a serious life-changing incident on something because I tripped over a stupid rug because I liked the way it fell on my feet. Or, uh, you know, I don't like these shoes. Those shoes look funky. Um, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> it, it's, you really have to be willing to make the changes. So, uh, I really appreciate it. Jillian, I don't believe I saw you pick up the phone anymore, so we don't have any additional questions, correct? Um, I want to thank everybody, uh, the panel of experts. Um, they give up uh, a significant amount of time for this, and um, which means it's really, really important to all of them. And I really, really appreciate it. Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, this is a really great job, Jillian. Uh, thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, you know, she is uh, she's a ball of fire, and uh, it's it's amazing to watch you work. Um, so I really appreciate it, everybody, and uh, we will uh, see what our next uh, next show is going to produce. I think this is going to become a regular thing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you to our viewers. We'll see you yes. guys again real soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.